This special edition episode of CRST the Podcast has been developed and sponsored by Genetics and Eye Care Today. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the podcast mini series Genetics and Eye Care Today. I'm Dr. John Gellies, and today with me is Dr. Bill Trattler. It's great to be with you, everyone. So, I'm the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute in Teaneck, New Jersey. And I'm the director of cornea at the Center for Excellence in Eye Care in Miami, Florida. Perfect. So this series will guide listeners through discussions about the evolving world of genetic testing in eye care, and will review how innovations in genetic testing have affected the screening, diagnosis, and care of patients with corneal dystrophies and keratoconus. We're at the halfway point for the first season of Genetics and Eye Care Today, so you may have missed a few episodes. Go back and listen to these episodes and be sure to subscribe to get our future installments. Okay, let's get this show started. So the Avigen genetic eye test helps clinicians assess patient risk for developing keratoconus. Um, Patients whose genetic scoring suggests a higher risk for developing the disease uh, may eventually become candidates for corneal collagen cross-linking if certain signs or symptoms appear during their clinical test. Now, Bill, we all know the components of corneal collagen cross-linking, you know, being that it's riboflavin and, and UV light uh, to create these cross-links. But I want you to, you know, can you give us a, a summary as to, you know, when are we using corneal collagen cross-linking in patients uh, with keratoconus? Well, John, uh, cross-linking is a game-changing technology. And as you mentioned, it's something that we're now using for our patients with keratoconus. And it's really critical that we identify patients early as this procedure can be performed to stop the progression of keratoconus. Uh, the procedure, is, as you're aware, is a probably an hour and 20-minute treatment. And it's often performed only one time in a patient's life because once it's performed, it strengthens the cornea and typically prevents further progression of the disease. Uh, so it's been a really exciting technology for our patients. So, Bill, yeah, the ability to you know stop the progression of this disease is extremely game changing. Can you describe to the listeners how the management of patients with keratoconus has fundamentally changed? because of corneal collagen cross-linking. Kind of describe, you know, what the patient journey would be prior to corneal collagen cross-linking and what it is today. Yes. Well, prior to cross-linking, it was really a problem because all patients could do was um, they knew they had the condition, they could stop rubbing their eyes, but the condition is progressive and many patients develop severe keratoconus, develop complications of keratoconus such as corneal, uh, uh, such as high drops. Uh, which is where the the inner layer of the cornea bursts and the cornea becomes white and it's filled with fluid and they end up with corneal scars. Uh, Many patients ended up getting corneal transplants and in my career I had a chance to perform many corneal transplants on keratoconus patients. And so it was a real challenge for patients because there's really no therapy. Uh, And so now that we have this treatment cross-linking available to our patients, we have the chance to make a huge difference in patients' lives. We can, you know, institute early and prevent these serious consequences such as high drops, corneal scarring, and other problems from developing. Yeah. And, you know, I I think it would be a fair thing to say that, you know, this this really changes the necessity of diagnosing this disease early. And Bill, would you comment a little bit about, you know, how this changes uh, our, our need for early diagnosis in this disease? Absolutely. So, you know, imagine you have, you know, a a child who's 10 or 11 years old, um, and they're starting to develop early keratoconus. If we can identify them early, we can treat them with cross-linking, prevent their cornea from progressing, um, and then they'll never need to wear contact lenses. They'll never have issues with school, with seeing things and, and, and the nature. So it's really this so critical that we identify patients early because we could treat them early. Um, We know that keratoconus can start in in kids who are 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I'd say, you know, obviously most patients I'm seeing are usually between the ages of 12 to 16 when they're first, many present in that age group. And again, these are kids, they may not tell their parents they're having problems. So the key is to try to identify these kids early and prevent them from developing serious vision loss. 
So one of the things that's, that, that you bring up in the early diagnosis of keratoconus that's very important is the ability to kind of differentiate between a normal cornea and those very er early and subtle signs of keratoconus. You know, one of the things that I think the Avagen test brings to us is an ability to uh, look objectively at risk scoring for these individuals. Bill, how do you feel the Avagen test uh, plays into the diagnosis of keratoconus or even just the risk of development of keratoconus and how that impacts uh, the way that you're going to follow a patient or manage a patient? John, you ask a great question. I think, you know, when you think about it, we originally only had corneal topography as a way to test patients. Um, and it was a helpful tool, but we then developed more advanced technologies like tomography, which gives you know both the front and back surface of the cornea, and even more, and lets us better understand a patient's level of keratoconus if they have it, and whether early or maybe still a suspect. And then there's been technologies like epithelial mapping, um, corneal biomechanics, and these all add to our ability to uh, identify patients that are earlier in the disease course, because again, we're trying to identify people as early as possible. But still, there can be questions. And if we actually had a genetic test, which we do, of course, we can now really understand a patient's uh, genetic makeup and if they are at high risk for developing keratoconus. So if you see a patient that, that has a topography that's suspicious and you have an Avagen test that says they're at high risk, well, gosh, you're going to really think strongly about maybe jumping in early and treating them early before they progress and lose vision because keratoconus is a vision-threatening condition. So the earlier we can diagnose patients and treat them, the better. And the Avagen test really allows us uh, to, to learn more about a patient to know their risk uh, for developing keratoconus. That, that's excellent, Bill. You know, one of the things that's, you know, really tough about, you know, diagnosing early keratoconus is the levels of technology that you need to be able to differentiate a normal cornea from a keratoconic cornea. Uh, become greater and greater. You know, we need more and more advanced technologies for this. And if we look at, you know, primary care optometry or, you know, a primary care ophthalmology or any sort of primary care eye care or pediatric eye care, uh, they generally don't have, you know, the, uh, the technology that's going to give them epithelial mapping. They don't have, you know, corneal tomography available to them to help make these diagnoses. So looking at things like, you know, progressive changes uh, to their refractions are going to be, uh, you know, a very important factor or, you know, changes uh, or, or rather, um, you know, changes to the keratometry and change, changes to, you know, baseline topography and being able to look at that. But that's where the the leveling of the playing field really comes in uh, with, you know, a genetic testing like the Avagen test, uh, because for those individuals who, or rather those practitioners who may not have the advanced technology to be able to screen these individuals at such an early state, um, you know, they can use this test if they have suspicion of that to raise even more suspicion about the disease. And this can turn kind of a wait and see situation into a, a referral uh, to a, you know, to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist who is, it does have this uh, advanced level of equipment. No, absolutely. You make a, so many great points there. I think that, as you point out, many practi practitioners, um, ophthalmologists and optometrists don't have topography. They don't, they certainly don't have epithelial mapping or corneal biomechanical testing, and to have a point of care test that is available where we can allow a patient that's suspicious for keratoconus to understand if they have genetic risk profile, if their genetic uh, risk score is elevated, it can really help us understand whether the patient needs to get further evaluation or if they're okay for a while. Because if they come out negative, then everyone's pretty happy and then they're in better shape. But if they're positive, then they could be referred on to a specialist. You know, for practitioners that don't have advanced testing, the Avagen test can be really helpful to better understand whether a patient uh, has a high risk for developing keratoconus or a low risk for developing keratoconus. And if they have a high risk, 
that a patient can be referred on to a specialist that would provide further testing and even treatments such as cross-linking. On the other hand, if the testing comes out on the lower side and things look overall reasonably good, just a little suspicious, then the practitioner can just continue to follow the patient along uh, unless some other changes were to occur in the future, but they wouldn't necessarily need to refer the patient on to a specialist. Treating patients with genetic disorders is a team effort. What role do genetic counselors play on that team? Dr. Nazneen Aziz has the answers. Genetic counselors play an important role in helping communicate the results of a genetic test, such as the Avagen genetic eye test to patients. These healthcare professionals are trained to relay genetic results in terms patients can easily understand and help them process what the results mean. This allows doctors who treat these patients to focus more closely on treatment than on patient education. Because genetic diseases may also affect members of a patient's family, genetic counselors can help guide family members of a patient towards genetic testing if it's deemed appropriate. Genetic counselors might also collaborate with doctors who are still building their understanding of the role of genetics in some disease states. These medical professionals can help doctors decide if a genetic test is needed for a particular patient and can help educate doctors about how the results of a genetic test can guide medical management of a patient. Genetic counselors do not, however, make medical decisions for patients and are not tasked with validating or adjusting a doctor's patient management. Those decisions remain, as they should, in the realm of the healthcare provider. When it comes to the Avagen test, genetic counselors can help explain to patients how a risk score is calculated for a polygenic disease such as keratoconus and how the test came to score them with that particular level of risk. For patients with a monogenic disease such as a corneal dystrophy, a genetic counselor can educate a patient about the possible disease progression and answer questions related to the particular subtype of corneal dystrophy found in a genetic test. All in all, genetic counselors serve as support for patients and for doctors who are caring for these patients with genetic diseases to help doctors educate patient, patients about their conditions. For Genetics and Eye Care Today, I'm Dr. Nazneen Aziz. Patients with progressive myopia and someone with early stage keratoconus might present with similar complaints when they arrive in the chair for a primary eye care consultation. Dr. Gillis, how might one of these tricky patients present? Yeah, so the interesting thing about you know progressive myopes and progressive keratoconus is that they both present very similarly. Uh, you know, Dr. Andy Morgenstern uh, was one of my favorite lectures on the topic. And he would say, how does a progressive myope present? Well, they have progressively worse vision uh, and that their current method of correction is not correcting them as well. And they're constantly having to change glasses and contact lenses. How does an early keratoconic uh, you know, patient uh, arrive to you? Well, with the same complaints, they have progressively worsening vision. Uh, they, their current forms of correction are not correcting them as well, and they have constantly changing glasses and, uh, and contact lenses. So when you take it in that capacity, the primary care provider is seeing these individuals and needs to differentiate them. Um, so this is, this is a very interesting area where you do have to tease out, you know, normal from, uh, from, you know, what is going to be a progressive a corneal disease, but in its earliest form. So how do you do that effectively? Yeah, wow, these are these patients are quite a challenge. So do you have any means by which you can actually assess whether they have keratoconus versus progressive myopia at an early stage? Like how do you figure this out? So the the main important thing is going to be 
you know, looking at risk factors for the individual, right? One of the great levels of risk factors here are going to be looking at, you know, the the various different, you know, family history, you know, uh, history of atopy or various different, you know, connective tissue disorders, um, and then looking at, you know, the uh, the refraction and the data that comes along with that. So looking for oblique or against the rule of stigmatism, um, looking for, uh, you know, corneal astigmatism greater than two diopters, uh, refractive astigmatism greater than two diopters, um, and asymmetry between the two eyes. And if you have auto Ks on an individual, you're looking for any K value of greater than, you know, 47 is being suspicious for those individuals as well. Um, however, you know, if we look at uh, early keratoconus and early myopia, it's nearly, you know, impossible to discern the two of them based on just, you know, uh, the results of a normal eye test without any sort of topography involved. Um, and even then, you can have, you know, very subtle changes to the topography where advanced, uh, you know, like what we were talking about before, advanced technology would be needed to diagnose these individuals early. So the Avigen test really becomes an extremely important factor in assessing risk, because this is not just a, you know, a, a subjectively assessing risk. This is actually an objective test of the genes and telling you whether or not this individual has low, medium, or high risk uh, for development of keratoconus. John, that was a, an excellent explanation. So so now let's just take this example. Let's say after conducting a thorough exam that includes the average genetic eye test, you feel confident that this patient has early keratoconus. What are your next steps? Yeah, so for somebody who comes back with you know low risk, uh, based on the genetic profile and overall, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, in the exam findings, those individuals, I'm generally going to follow up with them on a six month interval, just like we would with most of those individuals who we would see that are at risk for other, uh, conditions, but are, you know, a, a low risk based on, uh, you know, clinical signs, uh, and objective signs. Now, if the individual comes back with a medium genetic risk, uh, I may accelerate that time frame a little bit. So maybe instead of six months on the follow-up, I'm going to see this individual on a three-month sort of follow-up at that medium risk. And if they're at a high risk, I'm going to see them back at that three-month interval as well, but I'm going to have a much, much looser criteria um, for referring that individual out for treatment. So let's say an individual you know, we would have like a tolerable range of a diopter uh, of progression on K max, for instance, similar to like what they had in the, uh, the, the cross-linking trial. Um, if, however, we had an individual who was at high risk, had those very early signs, but I found that they progressed only a, you know, a, a half a diopter on that, I'd be referring them over to the surgeon uh, for, for corneal collagen cross-linking at that point because they have a high risk. We are seeing some progressive uh, sort of findings. I, I would have a much lower threshold uh, for that individual to get uh, you know, referred uh, for treatment. Beautiful. Now, what about um, the situation where you know, the average risk score is low? So the, the, average, the risk that the patient may actually have keratoconus felt to be low, and you're feeling that this patient may have progressive myopia, what um, is your next steps? Like, how do you handle those type of patients? Yeah, so this is actually a very interesting area, and I think something where optometry can learn a lot about, uh, you know, using this test in the context of refractive uh, and refractive management uh, by kind of following the lead of uh, refractive surgeons, right? So let's say we have an individual who has low risk, uh, but is a progressive myope, right? We would go ahead and we would, you know, look at all of our options, right? So just like refractive surgery has lens-based or corneal-based refractive surgery, 
in myopia management, you have, you know, contact lenses, soft contact lenses. Uh, you have orthokeratology, which is a targeted to the cornea treatment. And you have, you know, a topical treatment in the form of atropine, right? And you also have upcoming, uh, you know, uh, diffractive uh, spectacle lenses. So you have, you know, a couple really good treatments. So in those individuals that are low risk and have progressive myopia, I'm looking at doing any one of those. You know, I could use a treatment that's going to target the cornea. Now, for an individual, though, who has, you know, moderate or high risk, I'm no longer going to consider a treatment that would modify the corneal shape at all, right? Because I want to preserve one of the diagnostic factors that I could have in diagnosing keratoconus so I could catch keratoconus at its earliest point, right? So in those cases where they're higher, you know, moderate to high risk and they have progressive, uh, progressive myopia, those individuals are going to get treatment such as atropine treatment, uh, you know, the uh, peripheral defocus uh, spectacles. Um, and in some cases, uh, you could look at the moderate risks as, you know, getting a, a, a soft contact lens, the multifocal soft contact lens, uh, to be able to create that defocus for them uh, because the soft lens is going to have a little bit less of an impact on the corneal shape. So in a way, I would compare that moderate risk area or that low moderate risk area without, you know, corneal factors uh, being, you know, very suspicious in it to being that sort of area where, you know, a refractive surgeon might say, oh, we might do PRK on this individual, but we're definitely not doing LASIK, right? So it, it's kind of a similar mindset. So if we think of this as, you know, are we going to, you know, let, let's classify everything, refractive surgery and myopia control as refractive management, right? And, you know, we're using this test to help us determine, are we going to use a corneal based treatment or are we going to use a different treatment that doesn't affect the cornea? I love that overview. That was really helpful. And I think it really helps to understand that, that there are so many different factors that we have to evaluate. Uh, for our patients coming in that are suspicious for progressive myopia or suspicious for keratoconus and how these uh, two conditions can kind of intermix and uh, and really again the how the avogen test can help us understand a patient's risk um, overall and so how it can be very helpful in, as we help our patients and try to make sure they don't uh, have uh, issues that impact their vision in the future john i know that you know the challenge for many providers is that that they may not have every test or every technology available to figure out whether a patient has keratoconus, progressive myopia, or other conditions. I just want to hear from you just to explain one more time uh, in a little more detail just with the Avgen test and how that's really changed the paradigm for you when you evaluate patients with early keratoconus. Yeah. So, so I think the, the big thing here is, you know, how the risk assessment plays into it, right? If we have a low risk individual, you know, it, it, it's, it's not going to change my basic uh, follow-up structure for somebody who has a suspicious cornea or suspicious exam findings, right? Um, and the, the thing that really changes is when we have somebody who has, you know, a moderate or high risk, right? So let's say that individual who might have, you know, just very subtle suggestions that there's an irregular cornea there, um, but let's go ahead and say that that individual has a, the context of a higher risk. That individual, I, I've now lowered my threshold for what I would tolerate for progression of an individual, right? Um, you know, if they're a low risk and there's just a mild, you know, just tiny little change in the exam findings, you know, I would normally say that, yeah, okay, that's fine. But once we're in the context of higher risk, the follow-up changes, we see them much more often. Um, and, and, you know, mind you, the two corneas look the same between the low risk and the high risk. The difference is what the genetics are telling us, right? So the follow-up changes dramatically based on that objective assessment of the, uh, of the genetics where I can now say, hey, this individual needs, you know, much closer follow-up. Um, the threshold for me referring that individual out uh, is much, much lower 
um, it, it really changes, you know, wait and see into uh, refer and treat. And that becomes really, really important in the context of this, uh, of this genetic test and really what it's adding the benefit to, you know, practitioners and, and more specifically to patients in the ability for us to, you know, guard their vision and, and protect them from vision loss. John, that was really helpful. That was a great explanation. Thank you so much for that. I do want to thank everyone for joining us on Genetics and Eye Care today. Be sure to subscribe in your podcast app and look out for the next episode to drop in your podcast feed. Next month, we'll discuss the role of genetic counseling for patients and doctors using genetic testing in everyday practice. For now, I'm Bill Trattler. And I'm John Gellies. Asking you to join us next time on Genetics and Eye Care Today. <music>